Crab's Journal 11, Crab by William Bell. We spent an hour or so checking the lines, removing the fat little speckled trout from the hooks, and resetting them. She had a weight on one end of each line, from which six or eight short li shorter lines dragged, dangled, <laughs> with a baited hook on each. She'd toss the whole contraption out into the current and tie the free end to a strong stick jammed into the sand. The trick was to set the line in such a way that it didn't tangle or get swept downstream. On the way back to the campsite, we made better time. Being with the current, I got a good view of the lake from that direction as we left the river mouth, but I couldn't find the campsite. She could. After we got back, she showed me the wonderfully interesting job of gutting fish. What fun that was. Blood and insides all over my hands, surrounded by unhappy-looking fish heads and white entrails. Just as I threw all that stuff into the lake and washed the slime and blood off my hands, she served up the grub, as she called it. Bread, tea, and some tiny wild strawberries that tasted wonderful. Not like those fat red blobs you get at the, the supermarket. She called the bread bannock and cooked it packed by packing the heavy dough around a peeled stick, jamming the other end between the fireside rocks, and letting the sausage-like thing rest just above the coals. It cooked up steamy and aromatic and delicious. After lunch, I got her mad at me. She wanted to change the bandage on my arm again and sent me to the lean-to at the edge of the trees to get some clean rags out of a pack while she mixed up more dough for supper. Not having listened too well to her directions, I fumbled with the buckets, buckles and straps of the first pack I laid eyes on. I just got the top flap open. It was one of those big canvas packs like I had when she screamed, and I mean, she didn't just yell. She shrieked like a banshee. Get the hell out of there! What do you think you're doing? She shot across the clearing, clearing like a crazy hornet and slapped my hand away violently, sending spears of pain up the wounded arm. Get away! Don't you ever go into this pack, do you hear? Do you hear? Her face was contorted with anger. Yes, I stuttered. I'm sorry. I stepping back, clutching my aching arm. I caught a heel on the root and on a root and fell backwards, squatting heavily on my rear and and driving the air from my lungs with a whoosh. My ribs began to throb and I gasped for breath. I must have groaned. Looking over her shoulder at me as she buckled up the pack, she said, I'm sorry. In a more normal tone, she took the rags from the small duffel bag and said, Come over here by the fire and I'll redress that arm. She would not look at me as she did so. There's private stuff in there, in that pack. You must promise me you'll never look into it. She spoke in an embarrassed tone, but there was no mistaking the fact that I had to promise, so I did. Sure, I said. Yeah, I promise. I wouldn't cross this woman. I needn't survive. I spent the next couple weeks or so not doing much of anything, just lazing around the campsite mostly, doing little odd jobs for her. I slept a lot. Nightmares visited me once in a while. Bears chasing me over waterfalls of vodka I tried to drink but couldn't, and I woke up sweating and screaming occasionally. The woman talked to me for a few minutes and I'd fall back to sleep. The urge to visit Silent Sam was kind of strong sometimes. I would putter around the campsite trying to learn to make bread and brew decent tea and build a proper cooking fire. You make it small using softwood for a fast, hot fire for tea, or hardwood which you burn down to the coals for a hot, long-lasting fire. If I felt spunky, the woman took me up to the falls or for a long walk into the bush where she checked and set snares on the edge of the swamp for rabbits. After I mastered bread and tea and fires, I graduated to the important task of tr tending the smoke fire. Not a fire that smokes, a fire to smoke meat to prepare it for storage. She showed me how to cut the heads off a trout, slit it open from gills to tail, gut it, take out the gills, then press it flat and lay it on a little rack made of green sticks that leaned over a tiny smoky fire. After a few hours, the fish turned leathery and tasted like, you guessed it, fish and smoke. The rabbit meat was cut into thin strips and draped over the same rack. It took longer to dry to a brittle consistency, dark brown, and it tasted like wood. She called it jerky. Because the meat and fish were fully dried, they would be stored for a long time. <clears throat> a neat trick. How come, you don't want, how come you want to store all this food, I asked her one day, as I was slicing up more rabbit. For the winter. Can't rely on snares to keep me in grub. I also have to dry some berries and tubers, so... Winter? In interrupted. You're going to stay here all winter. I stayed last winter. Jumping Jesus, I exclaimed, one of my favorite expressions, except around my parents, who go to St. James's Anglican Church religiously, so to speak. Except most of the religion leaks back out of them before they get home. Which reminds me, the woman continued, you've been here long enough to begin to trust me, so I think you'd better, we'd better have a long chat. She sat in her I'm going to relax pose. This was, that was a joke. I had to trust, I was to trust her, but she had taken that pack into the bush and hidden it the day after I'd opened it by mistake. What do you want to talk about, I said sitting down, Indian style, across the smoke fire from her. Well, for one thing, I don't know your name. For another, we have to get you back home sooner, sooner or later. Not that I don't enjoy your company, but you can't stay here forever. When are you leaving, I asked. I don't know, she said. A veil seemed to drop between us as her voice took a bit of an edge. She tried to hide it, but she was becoming guarded. 
but when I leave has nothing to do with you. Well, why not? I could play this game too. By the way, I don't know your name either. We danced around like this for a while. It was kind of amusing, really, each circling the other, waiting, hoping the other would go first. Finally, she laughed, a rich, friendly laugh that dissolved the barrier of mistrust between us. All right, all right, you win. My name is Mary Palace. I'm Franklin Crab. Please to meet. Please call me Crab. I hate the other name. Please to meet you. And I reached across the smoke fire, holding up my hand, and she took it in a firm, bloody grip. Charmed, I'm sure. She laughed again. Come on, Crab. I'll make some tea. So we sat around the fire while a stew simmered on, in the pot for supper. I told her everything. Why not? I figured. If you can't trust the woman who just saved your life, who can you trust? I meant to hold some back, but once I got rolling, it all came out, everything. And the longer I talked, the more bitter it got. I knew that. I knew I sounded like a moaner, but it kept coming. Mary, the warm, sun-washed June day, the light breeze off the lake, the savory aroma of the stew, all worked together to soak out that poison. And everybody got slashed in my narrative. My teachers, my friends, especially my parents, especially them. By the time I wound down, I was sobbing, and that's something I've never cried and that's something because I've never cried in front of another human being since I was three. You see, I concluded, wiping my eyes with embarrassment. I've got nothing to go back to. Nothing and nobody. What the hell's the point? It was a measure of her wisdom, a quality I got to know and rely on as time passed, that Mary never contradicted this statement. Most people would have started to hand out advice, piling up cliches like old newspapers. But she just said, you're a very bitter man, Crab. How can you say I'm a man sitting here sniveling like a baby? Now that's the first really dumb thing you've said since you began your autobiography, she said. Mary was not, was nothing if not blunt. Come on, the stew's about ready. I felt a lot better after supper, full, warm, and calm. It was dark by then. A good moon was rising, and a cool, brisk breeze swept through the campsite, taking the smoke off the sharp angle. Off a sharp angle. We sat talking for a long time, our conversation full of long silences. Finally, I said, Mary, yes, Crab, you don't have to tell me anything. It doesn't matter. I understand, I think. I paused for a moment, and I'll leave if you want. Mary put down her cup and leaned forward intently. Crab, I can't tell you much. It's not a matter of trust. It's just better if you know nothing about me. I'll tell you this much. I've run away, too. It's very, very important that nobody finds out I'm here. I've been here for a year now, and I'm staying all winter, and after that, I don't know. I just don't know. But don't you get lonely and bored? She picked up a little stick and stirred the coals, sending little showers of red ash. Bored? Never. Lonely? Of course. That's why I'd like you to stay for a while if you want. I almost jumped and kicked my heels. You bet I would. Conscious that I sounded like a five-year-old with a new Christmas toy, I shut up. Silently, she got up and went over to the tent, returning with a couple of warm shirts for the night was growing chilly. She took up her position across from me. It's funny, you know, how a fire will weld people together, as if the leaping flames and the warmth go to your heart. So when she asked from nowhere, do you find it hard, Crab, living without the liquor? I just answered her as if she just asked me for... She just asked for the time. Yes, I said. I get bitchy and full of anxiety. It comes in spells. Christ, I'm glad it wasn't. I wasn't deeper into it. I'm almost an alcoholic. That was a greater confession than it sounds. What a bloody useless character I am, I added and looked into the fire, shame welling up from the inside. Don't feel sorry for yourself, Crab. Guilt is just another form of escape. My anger jumped, but I said nothing. She was right, so why argue? Guilt is another escape. So is self-pity, and so is booze. Although I was terrifically pleased that I'd been asked to stay, I felt empty and a little afraid when I sacked out, as if, if I could open up my head and look into myself, I'd only see empty space, a shred of darkness wrapped in skin. Layer by layer, I was being stripped away. The ordeal with the bear and the waterfall, my breaking down tonight and admitting that I, what I never admitted to anyone, including myself. What would happen, I wondered, when the last layer was peeled off, what would be left?'